Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the NAFS Ask, uh, Ask the Experts webinar series. Um, I'm Kelly Valancourt Strobach. I'm the NAFS Director of Policy and Advocacy. Um, today's webinar, Wading Through a Sea of Ambiguity, Charting a Course for Special Education Services During a Pandemic, um, is focused on answering some key questions about how to ensure we are continuing to serve students with disabilities while schools are closed. Um, we're joined by our partners at the Council of Administrators of Special Education and the National Association of State Directors of Education, who, I, who um, I'll introduce in just a bit. Um, this webinar is one part um, of a series of webinars intended to help school psychologists, interns, and practicum students as we all navigate the delivery of school psychological services during the COVID-19 pandemic. Each webinar will address some critical questions that are emerging as we move from providing services in person uh, to a virtual setting. It will provide guidance from experts and provide strategies and resources to address professional and practice issues. Each webinar will have a corresponding discussion thread in the member exchange in the NAS communities, and we encourage you to participate in the discussion with your colleagues to share ideas and problem-solve challenges as they arise. Uh, Stace, will you change the slide? Thanks. Um, so before I introduce our expert panel, um, I want us to remember a couple of things. First of all, we really are in uncharted territory. We are experiencing a pandemic unlike anything any of us really have seen in our lifetime. Um, your health and your safety and that of your families and communities really must be the priority. Um, this is not business as usual. Um, we want you to do your best to focus on what is reasonable and appropriate given the current circumstances versus an over um, an over focus on compliance issues, although we recognize that many of you are rightly concerned with compliance. Um, we understand that a lot of you have many questions, and what we are sharing with you today is based on what we know today. Um, we expect that as the situation continues to unfold and we learn more about what districts um, are doing, how they're providing services in this virtual environment um, as the situation continues to unfold, we may see more guidance and we promise to keep you updated as we learn more. And again, please know that NAS and our partners like those we have with us today um, are actively working for you and the students that we serve. We really want you to continue to share your questions and concerns with us, and we will do our absolute best to get you answers. I also, again, want to remind you to utilize the NAS member exchange. It can be a really valuable tool for professional collaboration, um, even more so during this time of social distancing when we may not get some face-to-face -face time with our colleagues. Um, if you'll switch the slide, please. So as many of you may know, the U.S. Department of Education has released several guidance documents related to a variety of topics, including how we continue to serve students with disabilities. So I want to share with you just a little bit about what we know about the three most common questions that we have received so far. Um, and the link to all of the guidance that the Department of Ed has put out is on this slide, as well as the slide at the end of this webinar. So the first question is, are IEP teams required to meet, in, uh, meet during a school closure? And please note that the definition of school closure might vary based on what state you're in. Based on current guidance, the answer is no. You do not have to meet in person while schools are closed. So field, next slide, please. What about evaluations? Should we proceed with evaluations where schools are closed? So the current guidance encourages public agencies to work with parents to find mutually agreeable extensions of timelines as appropriate and that evaluations that don't require face-to-face -face assessments or observations can still take place if you have parent or guardian consent. Evaluations that require face-to-face -face efforts should be postponed until school is reopened. Um, and we do recognize that over the, in the past couple of days, some school systems um, have announced that they are closed for the remainder of the calendar year, and we are seeking additional clarification as to what this might mean for you. Um, next slide, please. And lastly, can we conduct IEP meetings via phone or Zoom or other virtual methods um, that your district has available? And the answer is yes. Um, IDEA specifically provides that, assuming the parent agrees, that you guys can use virtual teleconferencing methods to continue to hold your IEP meeting. The next slide. So with that, I would like to introduce our expert panel for the day. You've already met me. I'm Kelly Valancourt, Director of Policy and um, Advocacy at NAF. Um, John Eisenberg is the Executive Director of the National Association of State Directors of Special Education. Uh, prior to assuming this role, he was the State Director of Special Education in Virginia, 
and has spent his career in special education, including having roles as the director of the Virginia Deaf Blind Project and as a classroom teacher for students with developmental disabilities and deaf blindness. John, thank you so much for being with us here today. My pleasure. And we also have, <clears throat> oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, we also have Phyllis uh, Wolford, who's the Executive Director of the Council of Administrators of Special Education. Um, prior to assuming this role, she was the Executive Director of the Missouri case. And Phyllis has had an extensive career in special education and has been a local special education director in both rural and urban school districts in her home state of Missouri. Next slide. Thanks. So with that, um, Again, thank you guys so, so much. I know how busy of a time this is for you, and we really appreciate you taking the time to share your insights on some critical questions that we have that we really think will help our members as they navigate this new, this new life that we're all living right now. Um, so the first question, and Phyllis, we'll start with you on this one. Um, what are you sharing with your members about how they should be providing special education and related services during the school closure? Thanks, Kelly. Um, and let me say thank you for inviting us and giving us the opportunity to share uh, some of the things we've been sharing with local directors. I think it's important that, you know, we're all on the same page because, as you said, it, it's true. We're charting new territory. Uh, we are in unprecedented times uh, in our country um, with every aspect of our lives and uh, especially that in education and, and with our students with disabilities. So uh, one of the primary things that we're telling our uh, our members, and we would like all educators to know, is you know your health and your safety is of course first and foremost uh, of importance uh, to all of us, and we hope that everyone is taking care of themselves. But as it pertains to education and what they're doing in their school district, we thought it was really important um, that they identify. Kind of where your school is on this continuum that uh, you put up on your screen and where is your school on this continuum you see from you start from the left where um, schools are completely closed uh, to the far right where they are completely opened so as you kind of walk through this continuum ask yourself where where are we and, and where do we lie and what makes sense for your community what makes sense for your family what makes sense for your teachers and your staff, your related service personnel. Um, and you have to think in what is reasonable for us to be providing, uh, given our resources. So first, um, what we know is that if schools are completely closed, uh, typically no services are provided to any student. Sometimes those are decisions made uh, by our local superintendents, sometimes uh, all the way up to our governor uh, where those determinations are being made. But as you move to the, to the right in the, the continuum, a number of our schools are closed, but learning activities are being provided. Um, they are working with parents and those activities are typically going on in the home and supported by the parent or the guardian. Uh, next, as we continue to move across that continuum, we see uh, a lot of instances where schools are closed. But teachers are providing those services, as well as um, speech language pathologists, our school psychologists. They're doing uh, checking in with families, students to see how their learning is going. Then there are a number of schools who have the resources and they have um, the, the means by which to provide this e-distance learning um, where <clears throat> The services have continued. Teachers are connecting with students, uh, sometimes weekly, maybe daily, depending on the needs of the student, and they're looking specifically uh, at monitoring IEPs and uh, looking at assessing progress. Uh, all the way to, uh, we know we're not open yet, but we hope throughout this continuum that people are looking at uh, where we are now and what will it look like when we open again. Uh, the next slide, I think, when we uh, question that we ask ourselves um, is, where are your efforts? Uh, where are you focusing what you're doing in, in your school? <clears throat> are you planning for when schools uh, are moving to the next level of this continuum? We hope that schools, uh, we know that some schools started out completely closed, and now they are making plans. And they are providing homework packets. Um, 
the work, and we would ask you to kind of take a look at these questions in, in your efforts in providing those services. Is the work being provided? Is it accessible to all students? How are you documenting what is being provided to all of your students? Moving through that continuum, is the work being provided uh, accessible to all? Again, when you are looking at uh, touching base with those individual students, is it focused on IEP goals? Again, we would ask you, what is, what is the reasonable effort that you're making to engage students? Um, then as you go on into e-learning through the distance where we have a full range of those services uh, directly provided, is the learning goal focused and uniquely tailored to the students? Is the learning accessible in the new learning environment? And are we providing those high quality services to students as possible? One of the things that we uh, would ask you to keep in mind too is in light of uh, the Andrew F standard, what we know is um, uh, that we are required to provide that faith based on uh, the child, enabling the child to make progress uh, in light of the child's circumstances. And as we know, our circumstances have changed. And I think that's the, the next slide that kind of moves in more to that faith uh, consideration. So if no students are receiving services, there's no obligation to provide faith to students with disabilities. We hope that all uh, schools during this time are looking at an avenue by which they can provide some services. We know many of our school districts uh, may be limited with means of accessibility. We know some of our families are limited um, through not having access, whether that be internet or devices by which to connect. Uh, we've looked at, uh, we know some of our school districts are providing through telephone services. But you must look at what's appropriate and reasonable for all phases of this continuum in light of the current circumstances. Compare the learning of students with disabilities to, the, to, to other students. Um, you know, we've had the conversation around what are uh, the services even for third graders, for that student who's an eighth grade algebra student. It looks very different than what it did a month ago when we were sitting in our classrooms. So education is changing for all. Um, and we believe that as we uh, have to continue to make some of these changes, depending on uh, the status of things happening with the pandemic in our country, that we would see that this continuum of services may change over time. Uh, again, we would encourage you to do the best that you can and to document your efforts, to document what it is that you're providing, how you are providing it, what are the circumstances under which you are providing those services. Hey, Thank you, yeah, John, um, is there anything that you would like to add to the great information that Phyllis just shared? Yeah, great job, Phyllis. Um, what what has, at least what we're telling our members is that very quickly since last week to this week, things have really changed rapidly. We were planning, at least as an organization and helping our folks that this would be a short-term event. We think after two, three weeks, schools would go back to sort of normal functioning. But what we're clearly seeing now is this is a long-term issue and that people are going to have to really rethink how they're going to do business for the next four or five months. And all the information that Phil's just shared is absolutely critical. Folks are going to have to really reevaluate their infrastructure about what they have, about how they're going to try to make some reasonable effort at trying to get services to kids. But the big, big, big message that I think we're all trying to send is that yes, safety and security, absolutely number one. But second, try to get try to get creative, try to think about ways to reach out to families and students as much as possible. Um, try to get uh, together with your team and figure out the best way that you can try to make this thing happen in terms of either virtual delivery of services getting creative with homework packets, uh, you name it, we've started to hear some really amazing things begin to happen. It's just gonna take a while for a lot of people and organizations to mobilize, to then give the level of support to everybody. 
but the message is, you know, do the best that you possibly can. No one's going to come out there and try to uh, beat you up for trying to do something good. So don't be worried about the implications if it's not perfect, um, if it's not exactly uh, best practice, but do the best you can to try to provide some level of support and services to the students, families, and school community as much as possible. So really, Phyllis, you did a great job with that continuum. I really like it. I think I'm going to steal it. Yeah. Uh, we, we hope that you do. We think it's a way to think about how we're providing services to students. We had a lot of directors put their brains together and, and think about what does that look like and how do we put, make people feel comfortable about what they're doing. And, and that continuum is going to shift back and forth maybe uh, throughout this course of time that we are uh, in our homes and having to provide services and our schools are closed. Um, and I think it's important. Uh, also, uh, we've had that opportunity to collaborate as administrators at the local level, uh, uh, well, even at the national level. Uh, John and I have had that opportunity to engage in a number of conversations, and we would encourage at the local level that you're doing that as well, that you're talking to your neighboring school districts, you're reaching out to your professionals, looking for ideas. Uh, there are a number of uh, great resources that are that are out there for you to tap into. Yeah, and just the last thing I would share is when, when this first started, uh, um, what we were hearing bubbling up from the bottom up was insert, uh, the local schools had, had decided to completely close and um, they were exploring the different virtual options. They were concerned that because their systems weren't 100% accessible to students with disabilities, that, that they were then ending all services to all kids. And they were saying, we can't provide services because we can't provide comparable services to students with disabilities. And I think we have turned that tide saying, no, you can't do that. Um, you cannot use students with disabilities as a scapegoat. Try to do what you can. It might not be perfect, um, but according to our numbers, you know, the vast majority of our students are students who are attending the regular education uh, classrooms and curriculum. What we're hearing, the hardest students to accommodate are going to be your low incidence students, your students who have pretty significant metal, medical issues, mental health issues, vision, hearing issues. But that's a small, small, tiny percentage of the special ed population. So do the best that you can. You, you make sure you are trying to provide some level of support to students with disabilities and don't use them as an excuse to not provide services is a fundamental <laughs> uh, message we're trying to put out there. So, so John, I want to build on um, what you and Phyllis have, have both said around, you know, it, the services that we're going to provide because we're in, we're in a we're in a new world. They don't have to be perfect. You know, we just need to do the best that we can um, under the circumstances that we're in. So I'm curious, based on conversations um, that you have had with, with your members and other educators, what are some of the creative or adaptive ways you have heard um, that school psychologists are delivering services to children and their families? I know this, this is John. Um, one of the things that we are hearing is that people are trying to take advantage of sort of the telehealth uh, concept, um, even though it's still sort of an emerging practice um, and we're not 100% sure about the efficacy in some cases, um, it's a start and it's something that we can provide. We've heard that there's many school psychologists helping uh, students, um, especially do some counseling and talking about the situation because it's, it's traumatizing for some kids um, and some families as well going through this at this point. They might have sick parents um, and just not being around friends and family and, and familiar environments. So we're seeing more and more people do uh, the telehealth uh, concept and using those systems. And we're also hearing that school psychologists have found ways to partner with the communities and, have at, and, and in some cases been able to get families who did not have computer equipment, um, computer equipment and the little uh, jet packs that provide internet in some cases and they've gone out on their own and found a local business to be able to donate some of that information, donate some of that kind of uh, infrastructure 
So people are getting very, very creative. In some cases, they're doing, um, uh, if they don't have computer technology, they're doing phone counseling with people or phone um, support to people. Uh, in some cases, they're doing some stuff with mom and dad to provide them some ideas about coping strategies or trying to teach them some of the techniques that you would use during therapy sessions or uh, guidance sessions with students. Um, and the other is that we're hearing that school psychologists have really helped local directors and state directors think about kind of the providing um, the additional mental health supports that are going to be needed over the course of time and ways that we can build in some of those supports into instruction coming moving forward so people are getting really creative at this point that's what i'm hearing um, but stuff is sort of bubbling up and i'm hearing stories on the news and i'm hearing my members share stuff i don't know phyllis if you've heard anything unique or anything creative like that yeah, I, I think it's also important to know that um, there are a number of our partners, um, vendors, our, our companies that are providing a number of their services. Um, not that they're looking to sell more of their product, but a number of them are offering some free services. And it's worth checking into those, uh, those vendors who already have expertise in how to provide some tele uh, educational services. Uh, many are doing that with uh, social emotional learning as well as uh, uh, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech language therapy. So I think they're broadening those opportunities for our educators. I do know that the Council for Exceptional Children also did a webinar um, with uh, their Teacher of the Year, Kelly Grillo, and uh, I think one of our vendors, E. Luma, and they talked about some real tips for how to provide those services um, which look different than how we used to provide them. So uh, I think that's worth uh, looking into as well. And uh, we know that some people aren't as skilled at, at, at the Zoom and uh, doing those, those types of services, but I believe those services are now free. They've opened that up. And I think those are avenues that we really need to explore uh, looking at differently. Yeah, the, this is John again. I think one of the, if this um, crisis goes a lot longer than we think, I think the uh, next phase after doing some of this initial just reaction to things is going to be the long term issues, especially around uh, reevaluate reevals and initial evals. And that that will be something that I think as multiple organizations are going to have to really think about is if it does go longer, how are we going to make those things happen? Um, can they happen? What does it look like in a virtual environment to do that? Or how does, what are sort of, not even best practices, but just initial practices that you could do to make that happen? So continuing to engage with NASP and other groups to figure that out if this crisis does go into long term because at the end of the day, again, we're going to provide kids what they need, regardless if there's a crisis or not. Well, that's just the type of profession we are. But to figure that piece out is going to be quite interesting. So I'm looking forward to having conversations. Stacey, you're going to be on point for some of those. Well, that's, that's a good, a really good point. And I would encourage those of you that are school psychologists that are listening, um, as again as this plays out i think we are looking at something longer term in certain parts of the country we encourage you to also share with us the really creative things that you're doing and providing services to kids so that we can share those with other people so that we can all learn from each other um phyllis i want to go back a little bit we started talking john brought up um you know the issue of telehealth and providing mental and behavioral health services and social emotional learning um, in a virtual platform and so from your perspective what are some of the most important considerations for school psychologists who are delivering or who are thinking about providing those types of skills in a virtual platform, including both individual and small group um, counseling skills and counseling services? Yeah, I think that's a really important question, Kelly. Um, uh, first and foremost, because sometimes those services look different, especially in small group instruction, uh, and you're doing that through um, so that through that virtual network, consent and confidentiality are uh, some major aspects of what you have to take a look at. So if having a conversation with that parent, uh, that guardian, 
who was on the other end of that service and uh, ensuring the confidentiality and the privacy of the student as well. And it's, that's especially important when we're thinking about the age of the child uh, and who's involved. It's really important when you think about um, any type of small group where you're trying to bring uh, some students together uh, to work through maybe some of the issues and, and the anxieties that they're feeling. So we need to ensure the confidentiality of all of those students uh, and ensure that our parents are okay with it. Um, there has been some uh, conversation I know in one of our states where the issue came up where some parents were taking pictures and some parents were recording. And so we have to make sure that everyone is really on the same page um, when we're providing those services in the home. Um, and I think the documentation of those services, again, it kind of goes back to our continuum. Uh, what are the circumstances under which you are providing those services and, and what do they look like uh, in light of the situation that we're in? You know, I, I would also say that I think it's really important to, um, uh, for our school psychologists as they're providing those services to maybe check in with their local behavioral health care centers as well to see um, uh, a number of our schools already partner uh, with the local uh, mental health providers. So how can they maybe work together in some of those provision of services or maybe they can learn from each other. Um, I know that uh, in my local community, one of our primary objectives here has to uh, begin to change our language a little bit and talk about physical distancing instead of social distancing because we are such social beings and uh, we like to be social. So there are ways that we can be social um, and still be distant. So that's, that's uh, our, one of our, again, behavioral health care centers that's really focused on that. They've also uh, talked to us about uh, what preparing for when our students come back to school uh, and even preparing some of our students right now who are experiencing anxiety. And then that anxiety goes to depression uh, and how are we uh, truly meeting the needs of, of those students. Our school psychologists uh, in our school settings, I think, have uh, a, a large, uh, huge responsibility. They feel the burden of truly meeting the needs of their students. Um, so I, I think those are some of the considerations um, uh, that we've talked about as local directors and providing some, uh, some guidance to our school psychologists. John, is there anything that you would like to add to yeah. that as you think about the considerations? Yeah, <clears throat> a couple things that have come to mind over the last um, couple, uh, last week or so is making sure you're going back and looking at the files too. Um, is to make sure that um, I think when we are doing uh, work in schools, it's a little bit easier in that you don't have the context now of the whole family unit probably being in the same environment for long periods of time together. And for many of our students, their home life sometimes is the worst part of their day or there is so, so many complicating issues because of issues that have happened in the home that now when you put kids in that environment 24 hours a day and then you add the stress of a family member that might be out of work now or worried about what's happening in the future, making sure that um, you've, got, you've got that consideration in mind as you're delivering some sort of services is that the family is very much involved and that uh, there are some uh, ideas and techniques that you can maybe help transfer to the parent as well if possible. Um, to help with ongoing social emotional uh, skills for kids throughout the day. There might be some ways for you to provide some tips and strategies to any caregivers or family members in the home to help out because a lot of our kids enjoy being around other kids and this is probably very difficult for them and they might not be great on the computer or not great on the phone, but trying to provide some sort of support really help with that uh, fight or flight reflex that I think a lot of people are going through right now. But again, the family environment is probably something uh, that's going to need some support uh, at this time. Great, thank you. So, John, I want to start with you on this one. And we touched on this a little bit already, but as we think about, you know, when we're providing services um, in this new environment, 
what what is the right type of documentation that you think would be helpful for school psychs to maintain at this time? Yeah, I, I, that's a great question. In a lot of our conversations with folks at the national level, the, the term that they're using and the, the term that was in, so the NGREF is uh, trying to provide um, all reasonable accommodations and um, uh, opportunities that you can to provide access at this point is making sure that you have a good log of when you tried to document or when you've had access to people for how long making sure you really have a clear idea of what you're providing and um, the the uh, intensity of those supports that you were um, trying to provide I think if you can document that you have provided some level of reasonableness of services what they were how long they were it will go a long way um, when this gets back to normal because there's going to have to be conversations that come back to um, issues with what was in the past IEP. Um, so there's going to have to be discussions about compensatory services. And if you can show that you have made good faith efforts to do something and you can have documentation to show it student by student, I think that will very much help your local director and then all the state directors in turn showing that you have made a good faith attempts to try and if you have tried and tried and tried and you didn't get uh, parents to pick up or you weren't able to reach that student or able to document it I think you've shown a reasonable good faith effort at trying and so I think those types of documentations are really crucial Again, the, the unknown to me is if you've got a kid that is going through the evaluation period now um, or needs a or needs a reeval pretty soon, those are the questions that I'm starting to generate in my head. What is what type of, what sort of documentation do we need to be discussing around those stuff? But in the immediate, it's just try to have some sort of log of your ability to try and what you did and how long you did it and really really stick to that because i think that's going to be the sticklers if you guys again showed good faith effort and you did all extent practical to try to reach a family and provided something i think you're going to be fine and okay uh, and hopefully people are creating sort of general forums and tracking logs so keep up with your local director or your state might be putting out some of those and some of those sort of guidance tools or share amongst each other if one of you guys have created something innovative like that share that with NASA so they could get it out to other folks um, that that to me is sort of the best starting point at this point and we're I think still at that beginning phase we don't know what this is going to look like long term so Phyllis I don't know if you had anything yeah, I, I think just to make a comment about compensatory education, because that seems to be a term that um, is being used quite frequently. And what we know is that um, compensatory education is truly a legal remedy for the denial of faith. And right now, we don't have schools that are denying faith. We actually have the COVID-19 virus that is denying faith to our families. So when we come back to school, when we're looking at that continuum of how we're providing services, I think one thing for our um, IEP team to keep in mind is that what we will be determining at that point in time is the student's needs once the schools reopen. And I think that's an IEP meeting looking at where are we right now in light of the circumstances that we just faced and where do we need to go? What do our services need to look like when we re-enter school um, for our students, those support services? There, uh, there's a good possibility we're not gonna be able to go back in time. And compensatory education is not always that, um, as one of our school attorneys put it, sit for tat, you know, you had this, you didn't get this, now you're having this. It is looking truly at the progress of the student, their individual needs, and where, how we need to move forward to meet those needs. So I think it's really important that um, we, uh, we can't stress enough to do what's appropriate in light of your circumstances right now. And as we move along that continuum and we get back in school to do what's appropriate in light of your circumstances then. Thank you. I think that's such an important point um, for everybody to remember as you know, as we think about how we're educating all kids. 
Um, so our last question for you, and, and John, we'll start with you on this one. Um, you guys have been so helpful to us um, in taking your, the time to answer these questions for us. What are the most important things that you, as state and local special education directors, are working on right now? And how can NAF, um, our school psychology state associations, and individual school psychologists be the most helpful to you as you're also thinking through a lot of these issues? That's a that's a great question, and I think the one thing that folks are really trying to focus on right now is helping locals get good delivery systems for online learning and to create portals and mechanisms and resources to give to people so they're not scrambling trying to reinvent the wheel every single day. In some way, shape, or form, every state has had some sort of online experiment or they have a system where they've got some vendors some schools are using it already is that people are marshalling those resources and then pulling together best practices tips strategies for teaching in an online environment or through telephonic sort of uses and trying to get those out to the teachers and to the local administrators so i know that is a huge thing so i think it would be really great for your organization to be able to have some of those tips and strategies especially around dealing with social emotional learning and coping strategies and then how to it maybe even delivering some lessons and ideas for dealing with the stress of of this crisis i think there are a lot of students in sort of fight or flight mode uh, and same with families that they're freaking out about this and how can we calm people down and get ready to sort of uh, continue life as usual as best as possible so i know that's a critical thing the other is making sure that the school psychologists are at the table when these discussions are happening i knew in, the, in when i was in the state department in virginia one of my most important partners was the person in my office who was in charge of school psychologists because you guys are the experts in trying to deliver a lot of this mental health supports and social emotional learning to students and creating that critical critical step to things that maybe aren't considered just the basic academics of English, math, science, reading. You guys have the other most important half of the curriculum, which is that that social emotional learning uh, stuff. So making sure that you're at the table and that uh, uh, folks are including school psychologists and other related service providers into those discussions. Um, and that's sort of what I'm hearing that people are working on uh, right now. So make sure that you're, you're being included in how to deliver those services in an online environment and tips and strategies for social emotional learning and ideas for lesson plans to integrate that into the services that will be delivered. And then making sure that you're at the table if this does go long term. What does it mean to do uh, evaluations, re-evaluations, uh, ongoing services in a virtual environment, uh, maybe till the next school year? We've already heard there's at least three states that have closed schools for the, for the rest of the year in mass. So we already know that's probably gonna expand. So make sure you're at the table and your organization is providing some ideas, tips and strategies for delivering services moving forward in those environments. Phyllis? Yeah, uh, John, I think you you nailed it um, when, when we talk about that collaboration. I think uh, as we model what we're doing at the federal level where we are connecting uh, our, our uh, local, our federal, and then our school psychologists to really encourage each of our state units that um, are working together with their professional organizations and then working with your state department to ensure um, that one, you're, you're following those guidelines, you're following the rules that are laid out. You begin to have those discussions about flexibility, um, what you are able and are not able to do in light of your circumstances. And I know we've said that a number of times, but we really think that's important that you keep that at the forefront of your thinking um, when you're working again with your state department and your local directors and your school psychologists. And then I think um, when I think about school psychologists and how they can be the most helpful uh, at the local level, I think it's um, not only continuing to check in with our families and providing those services as uh, 
we have been doing in our local school district to the best of our ability, but to also check in with our colleagues. Um, I think we don't want to ever forget that a number of our teachers who are teaching, a number of our school psychologists and our uh, service providers who are providing services to their students also have their own children in their homes and they are uh, having to provide those services to their families. And uh, so they are uh, teaching and uh, to their students as well as then having to look at how they're meeting the needs of their own children uh, and their families uh, during this time of crisis in our country. Uh, so I think it's just being astute to the needs of all and I think that's what we're all trying to do. That's a, Phyllis, that is such a great point is that we, forget that we need to take care of each other. And I think that's a great role that a, a school psychologist would be to help keep the staff sane <laughs> and provide some support because, I mean, most of these local directors, state directors, principals, administrators are under such stress right now. It's not even funny as they're scrambling to try to change a model that's been around for almost 200 years overnight into something brand new. And the stress level is just off the charts for these folks. And to have you guys be a calming influence and maybe help uh, support your colleagues during this period of time. And you guys are probably experiencing it as well, is that we're all in this together. And um, we're gonna get through it. Things are gonna be just fine. But in the short term, if we can all stay connected, take care of each other, and then figure out how we can make this happen for kiddos, I think we're all going to be fine. And I think that is what you both just said is such a is such a great message. We do need to take take care of each other. We need to take care of ourselves so that we can be better servants to the families and students that we serve. And you know, uh, in my small education community where I live in Arlington, I think you know they they did just close our schools for the year, and we've all been discussing how we can also just give teachers and educators a little bit of grace in this in this moment while everyone is figuring out no one knows how to do this right and everyone we need to, we do need to recognize that everyone is doing the absolute best that they can do um and what is a really trying set of circumstances so um Stacey, if you'll flip, flip the slide i want to make sure that we just end on a couple of, of key messages that we have for you um hopefully you have found what phyllis and john shared with you as as helpful as as i have found it um, again, we do just want to remind you that the federal government has issued some guidance on how states should respond to this crisis um, in the closure of schools. We encourage you to read that, to review it. If you have questions, please reach out to NAF. Please reach out to your local um, special education director, your state, um, your state director of special education. We are all here for you to get answers to the questions that we know um, that we know you have. There is a lot of um, granted flexibility in this guidance and again as both john and phyllis have mentioned we are still navigating exactly what that looks like so again please make sure that you ask questions and just focus on doing the best that you can and providing what is reasonable um, given given the current circumstances and this was mentioned a couple of times and i really want to stress it again that communicating with your families is critical um, mm -hmm as stressed out as, as you are right now about how you think rethinking how you're going to do your job, these fam our families are also stressed out. And to Phyllis's point, many of them also have young you know, young or older children at home who are there not only trying to, to work full time, but also trying to provide a continuous education for their students. So reach out to them. Um, use them as a partner in this process and let them know that you're there to help them overcome obstacles that they're facing as they best try to figure out how to support their children. If you'd flip the slide, please. Uh, we also want to remind you to reach out to your school leaders for guidance and support. As I hope is evidenced by the conversation that we've had today, everyone is collaborating. Everyone is talking to each other and everyone is trying to problem solve and they want to hear from you. They want to know your concerns and your solutions. Um, for some of the issues that they're facing. So don't forget that, you know, the role of your principals and other administrators. Continue to stay connected, not only with your students, but again, as both John and, and Phyllis have mentioned, with your colleagues. Um, we are going to need some professional support, some personal support um, during this stressful time and utilize each other. And again, um, 
I know it can be difficult to get some collaboration when we're not seeing each other every day like we used to. The NAS Member Exchange is a really great resource for you to get some professional collaboration um, in a virtual environment. Um, and again, our NAS leaders, our NAS members, and the NAS staff are here to help you however we can. Utilize your state school psychology associations as well as NAS for resources. Um, we have we have been pushing out a lot of resources related to the pandemic, related to teles, uh, teleschool psychology, I'm going to call that now, and to telehealth services. Um, we are going to be continuing to develop more resources based on what we hear from you guys and what we hear um, your needs are. So use, use your, your national and your state associations as resources. And again, you to work with your school administrators to connect with state officials for guidance. Um, some states have already begun to think through what this might look like long term and have begun issuing uh, some more formal guidance for, the, for, their, for their school systems. Um, if that's lacking in your state and you feel more guidance is needed, reach out to your state chiefs and your state special ed directors and other policymakers that are in charge um, and let them know what it is you need and offer to be a partner in helping them develop solutions. And I don't want you to forget the next four slides. I'm not going to go through all of them, but NAS has a number of resources. The links are all on this page. Um, I encourage you to use those, um, to share them widely, share them with, um, you know, share them with your colleagues, share them, share them with anyone in your community that you think could benefit from using these. We have um, on this, at the end of this webinar, we have two slides of NAS resources. There's this one, and if you'll click through to the next one, uh, but we also have some external resources. So we've shared um, all of the guidance that we currently have from the U.S. Department of Education. Um, there is a webinar that the Office of Civil Rights did. Um, and again, some other national partners that we work with have put out various resources. And we will continue to update the NAS website and push these out via our social media channels and our, um, our weekly newsletter to keep you as informed as possible. And again, I can't stress enough how important it is that you continue to share your questions and concerns and need for resources with us so that we can continue to be great partners to CASE and NASI and the other groups that we work with so that we are collectively um, doing the best that we can to put forth really high quality services to our students um, in this new situation. Um, Phyllis and John, I cannot thank you enough for joining us today. Um, I know how busy you both are and we appreciate your personal partnership with um, Stacey and I individually, but also your organizational partnership with NAS. And I am sure we will, we will be in touch and we look forward to working with you to make sure that all of our students um, still have a high quality education while we are responding to this pandemic. So thank you, thank you for joining us. And I look forward to seeing the dialogue on the NAS member exchange.